to another um, uh, sociological theory uh, lectures post coronavirus. Uh, today we're going to begin our walk through Marx's Capital. Uh, we're not going to do everything in Capital, um, but we are, and and, and we're going to be using uh, Tucker's um, Marx Engels Reader. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. We're going to skip all the early sections, and we're just going to go right into uh, Capital Volume One, begins on page two ninety four, um, and we're really going to just honestly just jump <laughs> into um, you know uh, um, yeah chapter one and uh, right there part, chapter one part one um, commodities okay that's where we're gonna head to all right so um, by way of introduction um, let's take a look at I've got just a couple of images I want I want to use as a um, as a sort of orienter orientation uh, to our current talk um, one of them is this so I, I just want to make a brief connection between Goffman, Hegel, and Marx, okay? And what I want to do is get to this concept of spirit. So, you know, Hegel's great work is the phenomenology of spirit. And, um, you know, in most uh, sort of Western theologies, um, the there's a body-mind duality, or at least a body-soul duality. So here is this uh, image from I don't know, we'll say the late uh, Middle Ages, uh, early modern era of a, uh, a husband and wife in, in bed, engaged in things that husbands and wife apparently engage in. And this is, I believe, a um, uh, the spirit of a child being sent uh, into them. So they're going to be visited. Uh, in, so in other words, those of you out there who don't know about the birds and the bees, this is where, where babies come from. Some god uh, will 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 send a spiritual being into you. So the soul and the body are separate, right? So the basic idea of Western theology is that we we ha we're, we have these organ sacs that are animated by these immaterial things called souls. So you know the big theological questions: where do they come from? In general, they come from a god or gods, right? Uh, that kind of thing. Here's another image, um, late medieval. It's from an illuminated manuscript. The um, and this is an image of the souls, uh, I believe, being separated from the body at death is what we have here. So, so these these poor folks have have, have passed away, probably of, of something like a plague. I'm not even certain. I think it is plague actually. And 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 and, and their souls are are uh, escaping them and and hopefully going heavenwards here, right? So body soul uh, duality. The body is a material thing, a kind of uh, sensory apparatus it can be seen it can be smelled right it's this this thing that uh, but, but but what animates us is a soul and you know any of us who have contemplated death or been close to someone uh, who's passed away or looked at at um, at the remains of someone um, and, and and seen the body without spirit it's an astonishing thing and you it's not hard to sort of imagine the origins of theological speculations this is a a little darker image or funnier depending upon uh, uh, your mode but here we have um, I believe uh, we'll just I'll make this up even if it isn't this it should be um, an aging relatively wealthy person uh, you know and as they are beginning to the process of passing over um, they are about to be transported these don't look like angels, uh, but as the soul comes out, we have demons here ready to take the soul. Probably not to the good place, but to, to the bad place. Okay, so mind-body duality is, is built into um, uh, you know, uh, Western theology, and it's built into everything we've been doing this semester. So in essence, what we've been arguing, like in Goffman, we have an organ sac, an existential self, that's animated by a duality and um, the, the kind of uh, the existential self as an I that can recognize itself and so on. And then a social thing called the performed self that, again, is wispy thin, it's, it's, it's as immaterial as a soul, right? And we talked last time about, about uh, the master-slave dialectic and how the uh, deference and demeanor rituals uh, generate uh, the uh, the mutual recognition of hierarchical relations, right? And actually generate something like the social self. That the social self, the self as socially realized, uh, comes to us in a kind of ricochet fashion um, off of the uh, 
recognition of an other. So here we had that from uh, from our last time, right? That the social self is is um, uh, comes into existence as we imagine what the desire of the other is, and uh, you can recall that. Okay. So 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 what we're going to do today is actually make a. Um, a very similar uh, examination. We're, we're, we're going to be looking at Marx, and Marx is going to be looking at commodities in this first chapter of Capital, which seems like an odd and, and kind of unprofitable uh, place to begin an analysis of Capital. But, but, but what he's going to tell us is, is that if we can understand commodities, which are the things that that are you know the material things that are sort of produced and distributed uh, in capitalism. But if we can understand what those things are, and if we can understand them in, in, as a duality, as a something like a, a body and a soul, uh, as we're going to use it, a use value or a utility, and then this immaterial thing, this, as he calls it, purely social thing, um, um, that's, that's an analog to the soul uh, that he calls value, right? So if we can understand the body, the utility of a commodity, uh, here like a pen that can write, and then the value, which is this immaterial soul thing, um, um, and we're going to talk about what that is, right? So that there's a body and a soul uh, to the commodities that exist within capitalism and understanding the relationship between body and soul and comprehending where the ensoulment of commodities uh, occurs. Uh, occurs in the process of production, occurs through labor, um, and then we, we, we can go from there to sort of understand our, our bigger questions. Um, I, th this is a bizarre 19th century image. Uh, it's called Electroplating the Dead. I think it's like from a Scientific American magazine. I ran across this bloody image, and I've always wanted to use it. It's grotesque, of course, because this is probably uh, um, um, you know a small person, so apparently a small person has died. And, and what they're doing is actually electroplating the body so that the body, that the death, is being preserved, right? So that the body, so that the person has died into something that is then preserved. And that the, the, this electroplated um, body then remains as a kind of um, trophy or material uh, remnant uh, of a life. So the person has died, has fallen, and what remains is this, uh, this husk, this electroplated husk on the outside that, um, that somehow or other represents, gives the appearance of the person that was there, but the soul, of course, has departed, right? So we're, we're, we're going to be fussing with this again all day. Like, like, like when you produce a thing in capital, when someone dies into the production of the thing, and a physical um, uh, substance remains, uh, is that what value is? Is value the, the, the actual external features and sensory and utility and comfort giving properties of a commodity or is value something that's, that's more akin to a soul and spiritual? I think we know the answer already. Okay. All right. So, um, let's begin with, um, with my map of capital. So, uh, again, the page numbers here are from Tucker's famous reader. Um, and um, I'd sort of begin, let's begin by, by just making the claim that Marx is, is um, referencing right at the beginning of the book, his earlier book, The Critique of Political Economy, came out in 1859, which is eight years, basically, earlier uh, than Capital itself. And um, in, in that book really is a critique of, a kind of attempt to negate, summate and negate the field of, of political economy, bourgeois political economy, recognize its limits and so on, and then use that kind of sophisticated language. He tries to cancel political economy up and turn it into sort of a critical uh, uh, apparatus for comprehending capitalism, not just as a mechanism for producing useful things, but as a social system uh, that produces and generates uh, value. And I have an odd uh, jumping thing here that I'm going to try to get rid of there. Okay, so... Um, um, okay, so uh, so the other major political economists, you know, Adam Smith, Petty, Ricardo, uh, Malthus, uh, Babbage, Franklin, he even mentions, um, Lee, who sort of he, he attributes as one of the early uh, sort of inventors or, uh, or, or uh, you know, people who understand the labor theory of value. So these are all political economists that came before him. His work is an, attempting, an attempt to sort of, again, kind of comprehend their work in totality and negate it up, right? To transform something that's sort of a positive theory of capital 
into a critical theory of capital that has the capacity to comprehend and change um, um, you know, the system, something along those lines. Okay, so from the book, The um, Critique of Political Economy, uh, Marx sort of maps out the, um, uh, what, what, what really the four major phases of the uh, political economy process. So I'm going to sort of walk through them here. I've got them in sort of sketch form. So, um, you know, to Marx, uh, capital or all uh, capitalism in particular begins with money. Money is sort of, uh, you know, capital and it's the general equivalent. But, but he usually represents capital at phase one of a cycle of production with an M meaning money. Money gets invested in a production process, so production is the first of the four economic uh, uh, mode, or the moments of the, uh, of the economic cycle. Um, and, you know, money is invested in constant capital in the form of property, plant, and equipment. Uh, you buy raw material. You hire yourself some labor. He calls that variable capital, right? And, uh, and then through the laborers going into the production facility, uh, you generate something uh, unique, a kind of alchemy takes place and commodities come out. So commodities are the things produced by labor in a, um, in a, in, 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 in a capital structure, uh, right? A structure of, 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 uh, of capital production. So the commodities come out of the production facility. Phase two is exchange. Uh, the commodities are sold or exchanged uh, for other commodities in something like, you know, what we'll use Amazon as sort of like the way to think about that. Uh, and you get money in exchange. That money, so, you, so you start with a relatively small pile of M. You invest it, you produce stuff, you sell the stuff you produce, and hopefully the capitalist um, uh, winds up with more M than they began with. But they have to do stuff with that M. So the third phase, so they've got all the money that they receive from selling the goods and services, but they have to distribute that money back to, um, <clears throat> uh, to some of it goes to pay the rent for the land or the property. Some of it goes to pay interest <clears throat> for finance capital that was loaned, say, to borrow uh, uh, the money to purchase the labor or the raw materials, that kind of thing. Some of it goes to wages, a very significant part of it. And the wages are, uh, we're going to find today, um, and, or actually over the next few days, essentially the value of laboring power is a, an equivalent to wages in a sense, right? In other words, what does living labor need to keep itself alive in perpetuity? And that is essentially uh, what, 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 what the value of labor and power is. So anyway, wages go to the worker. And then profit is kept by the capitalist. Well, what does the capitalist do? In a full-on capitalist system, the capitalist doesn't just go out and, you know, again, like Scrooge and McDuck, throw it in a room somewhere and, and roll around in it and, and squawk a little bit and, you know, uh, and enjoy the money t in, in a kind of physical way. Instead, the money that is resulted from, this, from the production process is... Um, is reinvested, right? And then you begin this process over. So you go from production to exchange to the distribution of the proceeds. The profit that's received then is added into the original M. Marx will call that M prime. So you've got more money uh, than what you started with, and then this cycle continues. There is a fourth phase called consumption, which oddly enough doesn't matter much here for our our um, our analysis. Consumption is simply the moment when the commodities that are produced give the satisfaction, right? The psychological satisfaction um, or, or, or the physical or material satisfaction, you know, they're consumed, they're burned up in the process of consumption. So, so the economy is simply this, this cycle of production, exchange, um, and then distribution of the proceeds leading to another, um, you know, uh, 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 set of production. Okay, so that's the four moments of the production cycle. Now, in traditional societies, um, you know, villages, clans, and tribes, those that are dominated by values, as we're going to continue to talk about, um, you generally don't have that full cycle. What you have in general is production, uh, direct production for use. You produce to consume, you produce to consume, right? So if not within a household and within a village, a clan, or a tribe, virtually all of the needs of the society are produced directly by the society. So you don't have the exchange problem, you don't have the distribution problem. You simply have production for use, production for use, production for use. You don't have capitalism. You simply have a mode of economy for direct use, right? All right. So that's traditional societies tend towards uh, the direct production for use. And modern societies then have that full cycle with exchange and distribution, uh, you know, and, which means essentially you're always producing for exchange, you're producing 
for a market, right? Okay, um, so again, yeah, traditional societies, you move directly to consumption, they produce to consume. So with the consumption, you're consuming the things you've directly produced. It's really only in capital uh, that you have this immense system of production, not for use, but production for a market. So that each consumer is uh, consuming, meeting the needs of life of uh, by purchasing the needs of life on the market. So they don't produce anything they need. And generally you're an expert in some very technical task and you're producing precisely the things you don't need that are then exchanged that you can purchase the things that you do, right? So it's this strange, again, kind of ricochet uh, way of meeting indirect needs, not by using your life energy to produce what you want, but instead by using your life energy to produce what makes money for you and then you use that money uh, to purchase what you need or want, right? Okay. And exchange is really, really important as we go here. Okay, and then the distribution again, the most important one we need to talk about are the two, the twin, it's workers and capitalists, right? Capitalists get profit um, and workers get you know lay, uh, wages and salaries, okay? All right. Okay, let's jump into uh, chapter one on commodities. All right, so um, we open here with um, a quote. Uh, and, and, and it's one that Marx uses both in um, the critique of polit political economy as well as in um, uh, capital. And the quote is simply that capitalism presents itself, um, or, or the era of capital. What's the exact phrase, actually? <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah, yeah. The wealth of, there it is, yeah. The wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails, yeah, there it is down here, presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, right? and its unit being the single commodity, all right? So our investigation, then he says, must therefore begin uh, with the analysis of commodities. So, so it's an immense accumulation of commodities, all right? So what's a commodity? Um, and a sort of little piece on King John referenced in, 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 in some of Marx's writings. King John, one of Shakespeare's uh, sort of you know, lesser known plays uh, that, that, that has a character called the Bastard who gives a soliloquy on commodity and so what is commodity? He says commodity is simply the pursuit of self-interest or the pursuit of comfort or ease or something like that. It's going in the way that, that, that leads to a sort of satisfaction of self instead of satisfying some external uh, uh, system of values. So commodity, he said, is the way of the world, the emerging way of the world in, 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 in early capitalism as these old aristocratic values are going away. So commodities, uh, you know, think of it as making this comfortable, commodious is sort of linked to this, right? That, that they provide something like comfort and pleasure to us. Uh, and that comfort, is, so, so, so Marx opens and then he says that commodities are doubled. So here we have one of this, this massively uh, important uh, ideas right here at the beginning is that commodities are doubled. So just like we have body and soul, right? We are, we're an organ sac that's animated by a soul in theology. Um, in, 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 in Durkheim's words or in, in Goffman's words, uh, you know, we're an existential self that's animated by a social self and the, and the social self comes to us from society. Those kinds of things, right? We're doubles. Um, we talked last time about, about um, the uh, phenomenology of spirit in the dialectic of master and slave where we um, emphasized how the... Um, remember how we did this again? So that, the, um, that person one... Uh, is essentially defined by the desire of person two. So person two becomes the form of appearance of the self of, the, of, of thing one, right? So who am I to the other? Well, I am what the other wants of me. How do I know what the other wants of me? Because of the way that they're, they're, they're behaving towards me. Hence, I am defined by the other person's uh, desire for me. So the other person's desire then the other person then becomes a kind of materialization, a realization of the self, right? So it is the other person's desire, what do they want of me, that defines the self, that becomes the social self, right? And we talked about it in the great system of, of lordsmen, um, lordship and bondage, or in um, uh, master-slave, that it is the uh, master's desire and the slave's desire that they correspond in some way, and you wind up getting that you know these two great social selves of master and slave. They sort of again to, to Hegel sort of launch us upon this phenomenological unfolding of human society, human consciousness, human culture, uh, spirit itself, right? 
And so, and so, yeah, so we get this kind of ricochet or um, indirect uh, uh, generation of a self uh, off of the reflective surface of, of another. So I am defined by the other's desire. That's who I am in effective terms. And so the other is a materialization, a realization, a, a, an appearance um, of, 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 my, um, of, of, of myself, right? So I, I appear in this way, and I have no idea why this bloody iTunes thing keeps coming up. Uh, let's hope I've now killed it. It doesn't want to go away um, for some reason. Well, that would be irritating, wouldn't it? Um, go away. I can't get it to go away. Okay, well, we're just going to have to live with um, that little strip of things at the bottom there. That's horrid. Um, okay, uh, leaving that aside, uh, this is capitalism getting its revenge upon us by, uh, by, by, by displaying my, my menu items on the bottom. Okay, so um, hopefully you can disattend that shortly and you'll overlook the flaw in that particular performance. Okay, so commodities are doubled things. They have a body and a soul. So the body is the use value, the utility, right? Uh, and that's distinguished from the value uh, or exchange value here. We can go either way for the moment. The distinction doesn't really matter. Um, uh, and, and, and value is the spirit of the commodity that comes into the commodity as reflected off of, of, of other uh, social things. So, you know, I'm going to maybe just jettison this for a moment and let's jump into uh, Marx's explanation of the commodity in uh, the German edition of Capital. I, I owe my under, uh, I, I didn't find this myself. This is something that came to me from the sociologist uh, uh, Mark Worrell, who really, um, I, I think, frames a lot of his work in terms of Marx's um, uh, appendix on the value form. So it's very clear. I, I, I really like this, and I appreciate uh, Mark, uh, Mark letting me know about it. But, but he has a really clean walkthrough of the dual nature of the commodity. And so, um, so you know, the value form um, of a commodity, the vert form, remember we talked about worth and value, worth and value, that, 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 that value refers to death, essentially, it refers to the fallen, and that ver, ver, ver wolf, all those kinds of things, right, refer to essentially the bending of a human being, uh, which can mean submission, it can also mean death, right, the bending down, the, the diversion, um, you know, that kind of thing. So worth, worth, vert, um, and value, very similar terms, and both refer ultimately to the expenditure of human life, right? The expenditure of human life. So that value, things that have value, are things that people were willing to die for, at least in the traditional meaning of the term, right? All right, so for a thing to possess commodity form, to be a commodity, it must possess a twofold form. It must be doubled. Um, it has to take the form or have the form of a use value, a useful thing, a utility, and also the form of something called value itself, just plain value. So it's utility and value. So what is use value? Well, use value is the body of the commodity. He just uses that term. It comes up in Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1 as well, but he really emphasizes it in the appendix. And it's the body, the body of the commodity. It's tangible, sensible, natural form. That's the commodity's body, and that's the thing that we use, right? So if we buy something like a bag of Doritos, um, that sensory form that we chew on and that, you know, that, 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 that forces us to you know, drink large quantities of beer to get the taste out of our mouth and so on, that, 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 is, um, that body of the commodity is, um, is, is its utility, its use value, right? And then it's doubled with a social spirit. He keeps calling it the social substance. Uh, it's its social form. And uh, it's really its soul. We'll use soul here just as a, as a shorthand, okay? So a commodity has a useful uh, uh, utility, a body, and it has a soul, which he calls a value form, a vert form, right, of, uh, of commodity. And that is its, what he calls its social form. All right. So we've got to unpack that. So how does the vert form acquire an appearance of its own, he asks right away in this chapter on value form. So how does the value of a commodity appear? How do we know it's there? It can't. We're going to find it, it doesn't appear in the utility. It doesn't appear in the body. We don't see the value of a commodity in its own body. It doesn't appear in its own body. 
So how does it realize itself? How do we see it? How does it appear? How does it materialize in some way so that it's available for our comprehension? And he says it's going to appear in the shape or form of other commodities. It's going to appear in the relation of one commodity, the relative commodity, the relation of that commodity to another, which is, is equivalent. Okay, so he says, let's start with the simple value form. We have two commodities. Two commodities that have different bodies. Now, this exact text appears in chapter 1, volume 1. So we'll, we'll double this here when we go through that in just a moment. But it's so clean here. So the two commodities that he emphasizes throughout here is the bolts of linen and a coat, right? The linen and the coat, the linen and the coat. And they're two commodities, and they have different outward appearances. They have different bodies, right? Um, uh, the bolts of linen look like this. They, they have a certain heft to them, a weight, and, and you know, a texture, and so on. And uh, so I've got two of them down here. And if they are equivalent in value, then we've got this little equal sign uh, to one coat. Well, the coat and the two bolts of linen by no means look alike, and they don't function in the same way, right? They don't provide us the same sort of, 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 uh, of, 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 of satisfaction, right? Um, later on, in, in just a moment, we're going to use something that's a little more differentiated, a six-pack of beer and a bag of Doritos, right? Uh, you know, these two things are both cloth, so you might get that a little bit confused. But they're, they're just, the point is they have different bodies, okay? So the value cannot appear on the bolt of linen. Its value doesn't appear anywhere within the physical confines of the bolt of linen itself. And the coat, its value doesn't appear anywhere attached to or uh, uh, within uh, you know, the four corners of the coat. Instead, the two things are equivalent. And so his argument is going to be that thing one, the bolt of two bolts of linen, uh, that they are relative and that the value of those two bolts of linen is going to appear in the equivalent commodity uh, for which it can uh, essentially be exchanged. That has the same value. So the value of two bolts of linen in a two-commodity system where you only have linen and coats, it's the only two things, uh, you don't have money, you don't have anything else, you only have linen and coats, then the only way that you can express the value of linen is in the form of coats, right? So how much is linen worth? Well, in this example, two bolts of linen is equal to one coat, or one bolt of linen is equal to one half of a coat. And so that's it. So the value, this social substance, this soul, that's um, of a commodity appears outside of the commodity in the form of another commodity, okay? So if there's only two things that can be in exchange, bolts of linen and coats, the only way to express for the value of the bolts of linen to appear is in the form of, uh, of the coat, the other commodity. So the first commodity is the relative commodity. The second one is the equivalent commodity or the relative value form is the bolt of linen the one that we're trying to find it's it, it, that related to. And the equivalent uh, form of value is the, uh, the thing to which it is equated, okay? So both are produced by human beings. Both have utility, different utilities. They look different. They take different, you know, this takes weaving. This takes, uh, 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 you know, tailoring in order to make, right? So different kinds of skill. Uh, but the body of the coat then, the commodity for which the linen can be exchanged, is the form in which its value appears. So if you can just think about that, right? So in the language that Marx uses here in this appendix, and it comes up as well in, in chapter one, is that they're a mirror. I took my mirror home, unfortunately, but 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 in the same way we were talking last time about the mirror uh, of, of the self being, the, that the self is something that is generated, as, I don't even have my image of it here, but the idea that, the, that we have no ability to see ourselves, we can only see ourselves as reflected off of the mother or or off of another that is giving us a social role or is affirming or honoring a social role in us, so too, a commodity cannot reveal its own uh, value. Its value must appear in the mirror image of another commodity, right? And so the value of the bolts of linen appears in the mirror of the coat, and the value of the coat appears in the two-commodity two system in the body of the bolts of uh, of linen, right? So each are are, are relative and equivalent uh, value forms for each other. So there it is. So like Goffman's deference of demeanor in which a person can't give themselves deference, right? You can't worship at your own altar. You can't basically bow down and honor yourself. Instead, other people have to do it. You can only have superior uh, demeanor if someone else gives deference, right? 
in, in the same ways that no commodity's value can be self-expressed. I think he says something like you can't, uh, that value can't appear in the same skin as the commodity itself, something like that. So a commodity cannot express its own value. Its value can only be expressed in exchange uh, equivalence with another commodity, right? And there it is. So uh, it requires a double. It requires a second commodity in order for the first one to have value. So he claims it's a social thing. You have to have a social system of production. You have to have uh, weavers making linen, uh, bolts of linen, and you have to have tailors making coats. And they have to exchange their products in a social system. And then the value of each of their labor then appears in the um, um, and in the products and the commodities that they've produced. Okay, so there it is. So the sole of the bolt of cloth appears in the form of the coat. That's its equivalent. And the sole of the coat, its value appears in the form of the two bolts of cloth to which is equivalent. Okay. It always requires a double uh, in order to, for value the sole to make an appearance. Okay. He argues that the qualitative determinants of value, of uh, uh, you know the relative value form, right? Um, uh, in the equivalent form, uh, where is it? Uh, value equals the expression. Oh yeah, so uh, value equals the expression in the form of a thing of the human labor power expended upon its production. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so what determines how much? All right, so yeah, no. So the what is value? What is it composed of? What is its um, ontological status? What is it? And he's going to argue it's a social thing. And it is, in essence, the uh, amount of labor necessary uh, to produce uh, the commodity. <sighs> Excessively hot. Okay. Um, so, um, so the um, so the 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 substance or the the the, the nature of um, uh, of 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 value then. Is um, in his words, it's the um, the, the qualitative uh, 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 thing uh, of, of value is the human labor power expended upon its production, and said, so, and he argues that what you wind up with is because it's exchanged, it really not looking at the value of any particular producer, but it's a, it's a generalized exchange. It's the it's he calls it a jelly of abstract labor power, a jelly. Okay, I like the jelly. So, so, so if you've seen clear gelatin, it's almost invisible, right? You can see right through it. It doesn't have any form or shape. It just plops down and spreads out or something. And, and, and jelly has to be formed in a body or a container to give it form, right? So I kind of like that. It's like it's this immaterial, uh, invisible, um, shapeless substance. And that the commodity then, its use value is the body and the innards that are at least the the uh, congealed uh, human labor power appears as a jelly I kind of like that idea uh, very 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 uh, visual so value like any gelatinous substance is not um, it's not really visible it lacks form uh, it must take the form of another body uh, to make uh, a sensible appearance um, so the coat then in essence in our model the two commodity model the coat becomes kind of possessed by the value of linen. The coat doesn't necessarily want to be um, the, the appearance of linen's value, but it has no choice. It does, right? So the linen sort of seeks out the coat, has to have the coat in order to express its value. And the coat, without, again, not really wanting to, behind its own back, it becomes the appearance of the value of the bolt of linen and vice versa, okay? So value is something, again, that kind of happens in the social unconscious. It happens behind the back of consumers, definitely. And to a degree, it happens behind the back of, 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 of all members of society, probably, except those who are sort of in the business of, 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 of you know, producing capital. It happens behind the back, right? And so, and so you, uh, one commodity doesn't necessarily want to be uh, uh, or, or have any, it's, it's, its function isn't to be. Uh, the appearance of value for another commodity, but it winds up haunted by that, okay? So it's a social thing um, that, again, that it's part of the unconscious of the system. And that's going to be his big argument here, that in essence, and this may be just a jump ahead, modernity, modern capitalism, is a world that's not structured by values like gods and totems and ritual honoring, honoring of, of, of elites and, uh, you know, with deference and so on. It isn't about values that people die for. Instead, the structure of modernity is value. 
And so, and so I, I like this notion of haunting, right? Like there's this secret structure that, that ensouls things and people and the world itself. And, and, and that ensoulment takes place behind the back, right? And it kind of negates and overrides any concrete body that we might have. And our bodies and the bodies of all of the things that, uh, that we uh, have as use values wind up becoming bearers of, of value, of, um, again, behind our backs without our desire. So linen possesses its value in the form and in relation to the coat, in relation to the equality of the body of another commodity. So this is, it. he calls it the mirror of values, that all commodities then wind up becoming the mirror of value for another commodity, and then all commodities then are essentially a mirror of value itself. Okay, all right. So, uh, so, so then really fast, he gets then from the simple value form is that two commodity system where you have the relative and the equivalent, uh, the relative being, say, the six pack of beer, uh, that is that whose value appears when related to the Doritos, right? So let's say they exchange one to one, a large bag of Doritos and a six pack of beer can be exchanged for each other. They're the relative value form and the equivalent value form. And then if you move into a larger uh, commodity system, let's let's say there's three commodities. Well, then you know uh, up up to maybe infinity number of commodities, uh, at least to what he calls the total value form. I'll just use his. Um, um, sort of representation of that. So the total value form occurs when there's a recognition, a social recognition that all commodities can trade for each other. So therefore you can express the value of any one commodity in terms of its relation to all commodities. Yeah. So you get this series of commodities. He calls it the total value form, which is a series of relations. Um, that would look like this. So you'd have uh, 20 yards of linen would be equal to a coat, 10 pounds of tea, 40 pounds of coffee, a quarter of wheat, uh, two ounces of gold, and so on. There's all, and, and, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right, to infinity. So that you could essentially equate the 20 yards of linen with every other commodity, which means that the value of linen now is something that, can, uh, that appears everywhere, that its appearance is simply the amount of all of these other commodities the bodies of these other commodities that would need to be um, present for an equivalence to be arrived at. That's its value, right? Okay, so that's what he would call the total, um, um, the yeah, the total value form. And then money essentially uh, occurs in kind of two steps. You get a uh, a total. Uh, let me see. You get, you get yeah, the general form of value occurs when you get one commodity that is excluded from generalized exchange and it becomes sort of a uh, you know, uh, a thing set apart uh, that becomes a kind of general equivalent. Gold is often, or some other uh, precious metal is often had that function, a kind of, of uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, commodity money of some kind, right? Where you set a commodity part like gold and everything it trades with that. So that if you have gold, you have the total equivalent, excuse me, the general equivalent that everything can be uh, uh, traded for. And then, you know, money then, the money form is sort of when you get a monopoly, one thing that becomes the, um, you know, a monopoly upon the general equivalent, and that's the money form, usually with some sort of, you know, fiat of some kind or, you know, governmental backing and that kind of thing. Hence, the body of the commodity then is its use value, and the soul of the commodity, its value, is a jelly of social labor that's expressed in full capitalism in the form of money, right, in money terms. It appears as money. So, um, yeah, so the value of anything then that's produced for exchange appears in money form, right? So money becomes the appearance of, of, uh, of the value of everything. And so think about that. If, if, so then if money becomes the kind of um, measure of ensoulment, the way that this hidden structure, then we really are, in essence, um, uh, something like money or capital or value itself is something like the ultimate sacred thing in the modern world, and that all of the other values that were set apart and that people ritually honored and were willing to die for and so on um, become much less important, in fact, get dissolved. And what matters is, uh, is value itself, right? So the congealed social labor that was necessary to produce the item and that was recognized in the exchange of that one item for another, that's... Uh, that's value that determines the quantitative amount of value uh, that's represented. Okay, 
So I think that we, we've gone quite a ways there. So let's jump back into capital itself now. So you've got the dual nature, the double of commodities, body and soul. And the body, again, is related to utility, uh, the thing that you use it for. And the soul is related to value, which, as we're going to find out again right here, is co a congelation of homogenous human labor, crystals of social substance, congealed labor. That's what uh, what value is. So it, 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 it is not a, um, you know, if we can just use this image again, uh, you know, value is something that's largely determined. It, 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 it is sort of tethered to commodities or accumulated in commodities or accumulated by capital and born by commodities, I think is the right way to put it, in the production uh, process by labor. So ultimately, it's the, it's the amount of labor that winds up congealed in commodities or, con again, is born by commodities um, uh, that is realized in exchange. So when you exchange it for another thing, it's only when you get that exchange that you see how much there was that the money form actually comes into existence in a simple exchange where you can see the other commodity that it would have exchanged for. So, so it's something that requires that social validation, that social realization, to use this term, uh, or, or it doesn't come into existence, right? And, 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 and so that's where val so value is a sort, in essence, uh, co-produced with the utility of the commodity during the process of production. And then it's realized in exchange because it always has to take the form of something that it is not, right? In the same way that I can't give myself deference, I have to find someone else to defer to me and tell me how great I am. Um, I can't determine my own value as a commodity and capital. It can only happen in this exchange process where the, 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 my value is expressed as a commodity is expressed in terms of the equivalent commodity uh, for which it can exchange. Okay. All right. So that's what it's a jelly of social labor. So the body of the commodity and the soul of the commodity are separate from each other. So Marx then says um, labor is the value creating substance and value is the congealed labor embedded within a product. So you get labor is the value creating substance and value is congealed labor. So you get value and labor are equated. The labor theory of value right here. We get a refinement of it. So the quantity of value is determined by the amount of congealed labor that was necessary to produce the thing. Uh, and then he goes into this long explanation of what social labor is or abstract labor is. Again, it's, it's just something in a world of many, many, many commodities that are produced with all kinds of different concrete labor. The, um, you know, you really have to kind of find a general equivalent, a kind of standard, right, uh, I, 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 that, that, that you use to determine uh, value, right? So like in a workplace where you, you have something like a production standard uh, for a bunch of different workers, some workers perform better, some perform worse, but you just sort of have this general plug figure that represents the, um, um, you know, the, the, the sort of average or abstract uh, um, uh, uh, labor necessary uh, to produce something. So Marx goes through uh, quite a bit of work here where, where, where he reduces qualitatively distinct labor down to a homogenous unit of standard labor, which means that by the time he's done, it's really labor time that, that determines it's time, time, labor time, socially necessary labor time. You get a homogenous unit of labor that all of the, that the gelatin that is labor is made out of the same substance everywhere. And so the, 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 the amount of the gelatin that constitutes the value of anything is equated to the amount, the time of labor, the time of labor uh, socially necessary for its production. So labor time socially necessary is that required to produce an article under the normal conditions of production and with the average degree of skill and intensity prevalent uh, at a time. And it's this formula on page 307, the value of a commodity therefore varies directly with the quantity. So the more labor that is necessary to make a thing, the more value it has, the more jello or gelatin that it's gonna possess. And, it, and indirectly to the productiveness of the labor. So the more productive the labor, the less labor gets embedded in each unit or gets it tethered to each unit, the less gelatin is there, and so the lower the value. So in very, very high productive systems, oddly enough, most commodities lose value and be, because there's not as much labor necessary to produce them. And as the quantity of labor increases, uh, so too does, uh, does, uh, yeah, does, uh, does value. All right. So then he distinguishes again, weavers, tailors, concrete labor, skilled labor. He just says that a commodity may be the product of the most skilled labor, but its value by equating it to the product of simple labor equates it all. 
So because we have this system of generalized exchange for every commodity exchange for every other commodity, that means that the labor necessary to produce commodity one is equivalent to the labor that was needed to produce uh, uh, number two, and that they can be equated in, in quantitative forms. The substance is the same. So unskilled simple labor is this primary measure. Okay, so uh, page 312, the double character of commodities are reflected in the double character of labor. So in the same way that there is uh, a body of the commodity that's produced by the concrete, physical, uh, sensory, sensorily available concrete, skilled, uh, you know, specific concrete labor of the worker. So the body that you can see is produced by the body that you can see. Uh, but value of the commodity, the soul of the commodity, is produced by this thing, this this um, this social labor, right? Or uh, socially necessary labor, right? It's it, it, it's social labor, so it's been abstracted away from the concrete worker. So again, um, so socially necessary labor time. So you get a really really hard worker, a really skilled worker. Um, less of their time goes into each commodity, but the commodity's value is going to be determined by that that normal amount that would be there. So if you have a rate busting worker. They, 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 they don't actually lower the value of the commodity that they produce because the average or the necessary doesn't go away. All right, so then, then on page 313 where he talks about the form of value is where he goes into what we've already discussed uh, from the uh, uh, value form appendix that you can't observe uh, value directly in an object. It's a mystical, haunted quality of objects and of laborers themselves. He says, if we bear in mind that the value of commodities has a purely social reality and that they acquire this reality only insofar as they are expressions or embodiments of one identical social substance, vis-a-vis -vis, you know, social labor, human labor, it follows as a matter of course that value can only manifest itself in the social relation of commodity to commodity. So there it is. So, so this becomes a really thing. And to Marx, raw social power um, as it expressed in, in every other society that's dominated by values human beings define themselves and through a process of mutual recognition, face-to-face -face mutual recognition. In other words, the mirror into which we gaze to get a self, the mirror into which we gaze to determine our, our uh, worth relative to values, how much valor we possess, how much prestige we possess, and so on, the mirror into which we gaze are other human beings who then give us deference and, and so on uh, and, and help us realize, make real, um, you know, we, we know we have high status or valor when other people treat us as though we do, right? So we have to look into the face of the other in order to see our own value, right? So this is every other system prior to capitalism. And what Marx is going to tell us in capitalism, the commodities that are produced are the things that relate to each other directly. And that value, the, uh, the amount of value of any given thing produced by human labor is determined not directly by other people, but is determined by the other commodities that uh, that uh, that that represent or that um, that give form to the value of commodity one, and, he and hence it's a relationship between things is what value appears to be. And what Marx tells us is is that behind the back of these commodities and behind the back of the exchangers of of these commodities, um, you know, like live producers. And so the producers of thing one and the producers of thing two are related to each other, not directly. They don't even know each other exists. They never see each other. They never smell each other again. They don't participate in rituals together. But they are nevertheless socially related to each other because the thing that each produces is exchanged and that the value of their labor as manifested in, uh, the, um, in the commodity is, can only be realized and determined, can only appear in the form of the product of this other group's labor. So we wind up with this social world of determination of value of things and people and where we wind up with a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a measure of worth for individuals and so on, uh, like in other societies, but it happens, again, behind the backs of people. So we don't look into the face of other workers to determine our worth, especially like the workers in another industry or produce a different commodity. We, we, we have to first produce a commodity and then 
our, 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 our labor time is realized in exchange with that other commodity, and then we ultimately relate to the other workers through the exchange of things, right? So it's this bizarre, again, kind of ricochet world of, of, of realization of, of, of value. Okay, so I kind of skipped ahead here a little bit, so let's see if we can't... Um, um, yeah, did I skip ahead? I think I didn't skip ahead. I probably didn't skip ahead. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. So then to Marx, yeah, raw social power not only builds gods, as Feuerbach, Hegel, Durkheim, um, even Goffman would say, right? Uh, more about that later. But uh, now in modernity, uh, raw social power produces value. But value can't be uh, realized. It doesn't appear directly in social relations. It, it appears in this bizarre, indirect manner. Uh, through the exchange of, of commodities. That's when value comes into appearance, and that's when the reality status of labor, um, you know, um, in congealed labor and socially necessary labor time, value itself becomes realized, right? So value is a primary product of social relations of societies, especially values, right? It's the main thing that organizes societies. Um, uh, yeah, so every society creates its own value forms, totems, gods, uh, uh, honorific people, um, warriors, that kind of thing. Well, they all produce them. But uh, it, it's only in our system with commodities and system of exchange and so on that you wind up with this really complex value matrix determined by the exchange of the goods and services that ultimately then determine uh, the human value underneath them, right? Okay. All right. So the money form of value. Um, all right. So uh, yes, yeah, so we've already kind of walked through that. So we have this simple form of value. I think it's here in, 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 in um, it, it, it has a different title here. It's not simple. It's, some, it's something elementary, I think. Where it's commodity one, the relative form, and commodity two, the equivalent of form, exchange for each other. So uh, shoes, and, and, and here's money being the mirror of value. Um, you know, in most of Marx's uh, work here, you wind up with, again, the coats and the linen. And that the, the fist, this is an image uh, created by Hugo Gellert, uh, a really amazing uh, social realist artist from the early 20th century. And in his drawings uh, from Marx's Capital in Lithographs, he always uses a fist to represent congealed labor, to represent value. And so here we get that relation of value of, uh, of two to one. Uh, you know, there's twice as much congealed labor in the coat as there is um, in or tethered to or uh, uh, realized within. Uh, uh, the bolt of cloth, right? So that determines the exchange uh, value uh, between them. All right. So uh, just really fast. Now, there are several points in Capital Volume 1 that are really important to me um, in, in my work on economic theology. And so, you know, I'm going to mention again that the word value has multiple connotations. You know, Veblen really emphasizes valor um, uh, and um, and, the, and, and, and as does, um, uh, you know, Bugel and others, but the proving of one's worth in battle, besting another, putting one's life on the line, uh, really essentially allowing oneself to be possibly vanquished, to die with honor, with, to, to, and then go to Val Hala, the Hall of the Fallen, right? So Val is our key term here, uh, which equals Val or death, and then worth um, um, or vert in, in German. Uh, you know, the ver is just like Verwolf, uh, uh, Vergeld, you know, the man price, werewolf is what the man, uh, um, 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 you know, the man wolf, right? The wolf, uh, the wolf man. Um, but vert re really refers to, again, to kind of like bowing down, bending, deference, but ultimately death to worth, right? So they have the same ultimate meanings here, right? So worth and, and value have the same meanings, vert. Um, so, yeah, so you prove your worth by besting opponents. That means you're better than someone else. You now have prowess or, pre or prestige, that kind of thing, right? And so commodities, the earliest commodities to Veblen are trophies that you gain by besting opponents, right? And, um, yeah, and so you basically store your uh, superiority in the trophy, and then you display the trophies that other people give you sort of social honor, you know, they'll honor and worship you uh, for wearing that trophy or having that trophy around. But in, in Marx, a value was social, socially generated in the process of production, and then realized and embedded in commodities, and then only, which are storehouses of value. Uh, but at the moment of exchange, then it's realized, and then the work comes out, right? All right. Okay. So, um, 
Yeah. I think we'll stop there. Uh, on, on, on that section, we can stop right there. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, we've done pretty good. So let me just sort of hit the sections I think are really important, maybe just because it's, it's for me. But uh, on the first page, uh, page 303 of, of uh, Tucker's uh, version, we have this great footnote on the meaning of the word value. English writers of the 17th century frequently find worth in the sense of value and use and value in the sense of exchange value. So, so that dual quality of, of, um, of, of utility and value that, that Marx is playing with here, he's, he argues is actually represented in the usage, common usage of, of, um, of writers who use, um, you know, worth to refer to sort of the, um, the value and use, you know, the use value, and that value refers to exchange value, something like that, which is kind of interesting. Um, then later on, he has this amazing, um, ar oops, argument, uh, so much for that, about um, economic theology. So let's see if we can find that again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, we haven't hit fetishism yet, have we? We have to do that yet. Darn. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do, since um, this is beginning to fall apart, let's let's put off the discussion of, of uh, economic theology in Marx into the next section uh, when we talk about commodity fetishism. Okay, and I'm not sure I'll get that. Uh, uh, uploaded yet today, but we'll, we'll, we'll aim at it. So we'll do commodity fetishism next time. Thank you. Hope this was useful to you.